Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, afternoon of day three. Uh, I'm glad to see that we still get people in the room on, on the afternoon of day three. Uh, I'm Ian Seal, the Executive Director of Three for All Foundation and our queer development agency, Many Coloured Sky. Um, I'm queer and agender. I've been he hymned uh, on screen and I've been anyed on my lanyard um, and I'm happy to respond to any pronouns that are delivered respectfully in my direction. Uh, I live in Melbourne and had my childhood and adolescence there coming out in the 1980s and beginning my queer activism and running my first queer youth group in 1990. Uh, don't get to, to run uh, youth groups as a, as a, as a peer anymore, uh, but still involved, as you'll hear as we go through, uh, in working with and for uh, LGBTQI plus young people. Um, I want to just jump through... Uh, I want to acknowledge today that we're meeting on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and all First Nations people here today. Um, our queer movements have always learned uh, and have so much more to learn from the power and resilience of First Nations people everywhere, fighting dispossession and the colonial project. I'm proud of the moments, and, and there are many, um, in which our movements have worked together, lifted each other up, and celebrated in intersectionality. And I'm saddened by the moments, and again, there are many, uh, when we haven't uh, worked together. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we're living through a climate emergency, and that it's only by learning and adopting Indigenous ways of living on the earth that we can hope to reverse environmental catastrophe and that progress on sexual and gender rights must be intersectional with climate justice. We're here today to talk about collabor collaborative responses to the complex and intersectional challenges many LGBTQI plus children and young people face, especially those in resource poor and discriminatory settings. Uh, I'll be joined by two people I'm very proud to share a stage with, uh, Manu Kailom and Sean Harris, who will both introduce themselves soon. Uh, we planned this session with a fourth panellist, Justin Biena, uh, the Executive Director of Youth Voices Count uh, in the Philippines, who was unfortunately unable to get a visa uh, in time to attend in person, um, and who would have helped to bring down the, the average age of, the, of the, the panellists and get us closer to looking like young people ourselves. Um, Justin has indicated that he's happy for me to speak about his and our work today um, and to share my experiences of our work with and for LGBTQI plus children and young people in the Philippines. Uh, I'm excited to be sharing with you today our evolving work on a framework and a strategy for achieving the best possible world for LGBTQI children and young people. If all the bits come together, we'll be launching the framework and a second Asia Pacific wide grant round in Bangkok mid-year. So today is a sneak peek of our shared work and its origins and the strategies and evidence that underpins the work. So a little about Many Coloured Sky as background to the session. Uh, we are an Australian registered charity. We're 10 years old this year. Um, as you can see on the screen, our mission and our role is to uh, build the capacity and work to enable uh, the, the, the work of marginalised and vulnerable LGBTQI plus communities in particularly resource poor and complex settings. Uh, we're tiny, um, we're, we're two staff, Ma Manu and I are, are many coloured sky in terms of paid staff, uh, although we do have a significant and growing number of volunteers um, and I expect that we always will be largely driven by volunteer effort. Um, I'm excited to say that on top of the two of us as staff we are adding four paid internships um, to our, our, our clique uh, when, as soon as we head back to, to Melbourne this week and those four paid internships are all for LGBTQI plus refugees and people seeking asylum. Thank you. Uh, I'm also proud to say that while we're small, we, we pay the salaries of 43 activists in LGBTQI plus organisations in uh, Africa and the Asia Pacific. Uh, it's not about growing our own footprint. It's not about setting up our own offices. Uh, it's about building the capacity in those communities. Uh, so our vision, as you can see there, is that LGBTQI plus communities in discriminatory, resource poor and complex settings and are, are enabled to move beyond those constraints to achieve their own goals and to exercise universal human rights and freedoms. 
it's, it's a little bit clumsy to talk about someone um, kicking, <laughs> kicking an, own, an own goal, um, but clearly what we're saying here is that our work is, is, the, is the work of the communities we partner with. Um, it's not that we make, you know, that, we, that we decide what, what work needs to be done and what the priorities are of the communities we work in. Uh, there are four priority areas in our work and they describe both how we work and the key populations we're currently working with. Uh, really, we began um, as a response to frustration about how development and aid agencies and many large community service providers, both domestically and internationally, work with the communities that they, that they support. After 15 years as a queer activist and organiser and four years in academia, uh, I had a few years as a consultant and one of those consultancies was for UNICEF in the, in the Philippines. Uh, this experience was the origin of both Many Coloured Sky as an organisation and We Are the Rainbow as a project. So my role in that consultancy was to review uh, elements of the HIV prevention strategy that UNICEF had for young people across the Philippines and particularly focus on their peer education and peer outreach programs. As a part of that, um, I asked to meet with focus groups of the, of the young people that they supported, um, and that meant in the, in the clumsy language of, of the HIV sector, uh, meeting with young MSM, um, you know, men who have sex with men or males who have sex with males, even though half the people in the room actually identified as female, as, as trans girls. Um, only the first of many, many transgressions um, that, that, that I saw in, that, in the short period of time that I was initially there. Uh, so I spoke to a group of young people and, you know, being familiar with the, with the way HIV works and having worked with young, young MSM in Australia, I expected to meet with a group of 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds who were sexually active with other 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds and the, and the role in terms of HIV prevention was safe sex education, access to condoms, etc. Um, the room was actually full of 10 and 11 and 12 year olds, uh, many of whom were sexually active with adults for money. Um, they were homeless, they'd been kicked out of their, their, their homes by their families, uh, they'd been kicked out of schools or bullied out of schools, um, they were sex working for survival. Um, but UNICEF saw the role of uh, their role in HIV prevention education being how to, how to better teach uh, these young people how to use condoms. So I did meet with, with some of those young people through the grassroots LGBT organisations that supported them a number of times, um, and both they and the LGBT organisations themselves made it very clear, if it wasn't already, that what those young people needed was someone who loved and nurtured them, a roof over their heads, three meals a day and a good education. Uh, so really, it was in that, that moment and hearing those things that um, you know, we, we, we talked about what, what kinds of things could happen? How could we work differently with that, with that community and how could we support young people in that community? And everything's grown from there. Um, so if we fast forward a couple of years from, from that experience in the Philippines, um, I should say as, as we're showing these that um, you'll see young people in the programs, they've all given consent and their families <coughs> have given consent for these photos to be shown, but I would ask that you don't photograph and reproduce these pictures, please. Um, so if we fast forward a couple of years, um, while well, a group of friends and colleagues and I uh, established Many Coloured Sky, um, We Are The Rainbow began as a youth-led collaboration between Many Coloured Sky and the Davao City LGBT Coalition in the Southern Philippines, uh, bringing in other stakeholders over time. Uh, we began by establishing and resourcing peer support programs as a way to meet an identified need, but also as a way to undertake action research, to learn directly from the young people about what they needed and what they wanted, um, about their strengths and their ambitions, as well as their challenges and their, their barriers. Uh, we took those learnings to local government and social services. Uh, we ran activities with those organisations that were partly professional development and partly advocacy, as well as coalition building. And this was slow work that took place over many, many months. Um, as the peer support programs grew, young peer leaders worked with us to co-design all of the content and we ran training programs to support a larger pool of young people to become peer support facilitators. This also entailed co-development of codes of conduct, peer support manuals and modules and peer program guidelines as, as the program grew. 
and you can see there a brainstorm from one of the groups of young people about what they wanted from peer support. We engage local queer social workers to assist and to ensure a queer-friendly child protection lens over all of the work. Uh, this also enabled us to build relationships with local governments who employ those social workers and with child protection agencies who in general had very poor understanding of the needs of LGBTQI plus children. Most commonly, that poor understanding expressed itself as a belief that by choosing to be LGBTQI plus, children were themselves to blame when they experienced sexual assault and violence. So we developed and began running professional development for these agencies and advocated for openly queer organisations to join and work with the City Council for the Welfare of Children. Next, we co-developed and co-facilitated a pilot program for parents of LGBTQI plus children, again at the re request of the young people themselves, uh, and then a train the trainer so that local LGBT organisations could continue to run those parent programs. Many young people and many of the organisations that we've worked with have told us that this was the key to everything else, that this was the central, of central importance, was to assist parents to understand the needs of their, of their kids um, and to love and, and nurture them for, for who they are. Uh, so these are just some photos from um, various of the peer education activities. Uh, they still continue today. Our, our biggest challenge now is just finding the funding to continue the, these programs to run, not, not, the, not the, um, the skills or the, the passion of the facilitators themselves. Um, a lot of the work has been about lobbying and working with stakeholders, um, using my, my white foreigner privilege to be able to knock on doors that were harder for LGBTQ locals to, to knock on. Um, me meeting stakeholders back at UNICEF, um, Save the Children, Philippines government and others, and asking, begging, lobbying for resources and at the same time sharing understandings from the community um, about what was needed. Um, this did enable us to engage in dialogue with the departments of education, health and social welfare and development, uh, and to also establish a program that worked in schools. Uh, I know often when we, when we talk about working in schools, people think about curriculum, and, and, I, and curriculum is absolutely central and important in ensuring that all the kids understand um, LG, LGBTQI plus experiences and rights. Uh, but the real work is actually with the teachers and with the policies of the school to ensure that it's a, a safe and supportive climate uh, for all students. And that was the hard work that, that the, these young people uh, did by our sides. Um, young people led all of the work and we reviewed and evaluated every step together. So we came back after every program, every strategy, every new training um, and looked at what we'd learned together, what we, what we could change, what we could build on. And this, if we can get it to work, is um, what, what some of the young people had to say afterwards. Part of the Rainbow is an organization that helps me to become the person I am today. It opens up a lot of opportunities for me to express more of myself, to find my strengths, and develop it to become the best version of me. Through this organization, I was able to connect with other LGBTQ plus youth in our community and was able to listen with their different inspirational and motivational stories. And with this experience, I realized that I want to become a voice to my fellow LGBTQ plus youth in our community because a lot of them are struggling. How did We Are The Rainbow help you? Uh, I'm very thankful with We Are The Rainbow because We Are The Rainbow helped me a lot. This platform helped me a lot. To become who am I, to be being true to myself. Because this is a platform we're in, they will help you to be who you really you are and accept who you are. Hi, I'm Arjun Pilia Farite. Trans. What challenges do LGBT young people experience? Discrimination. How did We Are The Rainbow help you? Give, give courage to young ones. What did you learn? Be proud, be proud 
Be proud of who you are. What was the best thing about the program? Molding young LGBT. <laughs> what was the best thing about this program? The best thing about this program is they will mold you, they will not hate you, they will accept you, and they will help you to become who you are and to be more knowledgeable with regards to the community. And by this, they can also empower and they will also help those young people who are very shy to accept their self and of course to be accepted by their family. Thank you so much. Well, the best thing about the program is that it serves as an opening eye to the parents that there is nothing wrong with their child. All they need is the support, the love, the acceptance that is coming from them. With the different programs that was conducted, a lot of people such as students, parents, and etc. were able to understand our community better. With the help of the different seminars that was conducted in every school in our community and also in our barangay. That's why I am very thankful with this organization and I am very proud that I am part of it. Hi, I'm Juni Bayugin and I'm gay. What challenges do LGBT young people experience? Most challenges young LGBT people experience is um, not being accepted by the, or really who they are. How did We Are The Rainbow help you? We Are The Rainbow help us um, to mold ourselves and on how we, we, we can be brave of who we are and by saying that let not let the world change us, let us change the world. What did you learn? I learned a lot, especially on how to, uh, to deal with the people who hate us. Instead of hating them, we must show them what we can do. And what was the best thing about the program? The best thing about the program is uh, being educated, not only the young LGBT, but also our parents, uh, for them to know who we are on how to accept since we are really born this way by Lady Gaga. <laughs> I, I think I know Junie well enough that I'm allowed to say at, at the start when he says I'm gay, the response should be, duh. Um. <laughs> we are... Oh. Uh, so the, the, the work that, we've just, that I've um, described in the, in the video uh, in the last 10 minutes represents seven, seven years of work. Um, and what we've been attempting to do over the last couple of years is distill that into something that we can share with, with other communities more broadly. So this, in a nutshell, is uh, what the We Are The Rainbow framework now looks like, uh, where um, the, the, first three, the first three stripes, if you like, the, around LGBTQI plus children and young people having rights, that in spite of this they experience discrimination, prejudice, violence and rejection, and that this has significant and long-lasting impacts on their health, well-being and life opportunities. These are the why of the work. Um, and what we've been able to do to support uh, our, our partner organisations in the Philippines and elsewhere to advocate for recognition of this um, is develop a range of uh, discussion papers based on international literature of what we know about the experiences. So they're something that we can share with our partner communities so that they can develop an argument to their stakeholders and to their governments about why change is needed. Uh, the next two are really about the, um, the how, the how we work, um, and I'll, I'll delve into that a little bit in a second. Um, and then finally is kind of the, the, the what we're doing to support uh, that work. So, uh, as I just mentioned, the, you know, the, the, the first bit is about having some draft papers. All of this will be available. If, 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 if I'd chosen the, um, the timeline for World Pride, it would be about six months later than this, and we'd be able to launch this officially. Um, we have eight projects that are piloting this now in other, in other communities across the, across the Asia-Pacific, and it's when we hear from them and learn from them and adapt and respond uh, to, to those learnings that we'll then be sharing this more publicly than today. 
Um, so all of the work is really distilled down to a couple of key principles, and the first of which is recognising that LGBTQI plus children have all the rights of other children, um, and they have uh, SOGESque rights. Um, that should be um, a no-brainer for, for, well, I'm sure it's a no-brainer for everyone in this room, but sadly we find uh, many stakeholders and people in government not understanding um, that LGBTQI plus children have all of those rights. So it's a key part of the work is to, to help um, and, and advocate for understanding of that. Secondly, the key principle is recognising that um, young people exist in various social environments and that's where prejudice and discrimination happens and that's where the work needs to be done to create change. Um, I'm sure I'm not telling anyone in this room anything they don't already know when I say there is nothing wrong with these kids. They don't need fixing. The environments they're in are what need fixing and so that's the, that's the strategy, I guess, that sits behind this. Um, and so these are the social environments that we've identified um, that are amenable to work uh, and where we've been able to kind of create models in, it, based in, in the Philippines um, and now uh, adapt those or support other communities to adapt those in other places. So it's focusing on the family, on schools, on local government and local community. It's recognising the role of LGBTQI plus community in terms of advocacy and support uh, and also social and health services. Um, it's a, as, you've, as you've probably um, gathered so far, it, it's, a, it's a strategy that's embedded in community. It's about communities taking control and leading, um, and it's about the changes they can make in their own community. But it's also very clearly about building an advocacy strategy and creating larger level social change. So we, you know, we recognise that um, our human rights are enacted in particular social environments and so that's where, that's where the battle is for human rights, is recognising what needs to happen in schools and in communities and in services. Um, lived experience is clearly the platform for advocacy. Um, if the, the, more, the more young people who have a voice, who have the opportunity to meet with peers, who build the resilience that comes from networking in their communities, the more voices there are to advocate for change. Um, I think it's probably really crucial to, to, to mention the, the role of parents as, as allies and advocates in this. Um, our, our, our parents can be our worst nightmare uh, for many, many LGBTQI plus children and young people, but they can also be, be very passionate allies and can open doors and create change that is very difficult for young people to do themselves. Um, what we can do in Australia is different from what we can uh, do in the Philippines and what we can do in the Philippines will be different from what we can do in any other community or environment. So we recognise another key uh, plank of the work is that communities need to start where they can um, and we can't expect uh, people to stand up, a, you know, a young person to stand up publicly and identify as queer and do the work of advocacy if they're un unsafe to do so. Uh, so in, in uh, broadening this to working in other communities, we've developed a range of tools that help them to think through what they can do in their environments um, and support them to start where they want to start and to start where they can. Uh, these are the priority areas based on those um, social environments and I'm really excited to say that um, in December last year we put a grant round out um, across the Asia Pacific to LGBTQI plus youth led organisations. Uh, we did that in partnership with, with Youth Voices Count, as I said Justin who uh, was meant to be here today as their executive director. Uh, Youth Voices Count, for people who don't know them, um, are, the, uh, are a, a voice across the region for LGBTQI plus youth activists. Uh, and um, in, in working with them, we were able to gather 27 expressions of interest in partnership in working with us uh, and able to provide uh, funding to five projects initially to take on some very exciting work in their communities. Um, so there's a range of ways in which we're supporting that, that growth and, and that rollout. Um, those five communities, uh, two of them are in India, one is working with schools and doing that kind of whole school change around professional development for teachers and understanding the cultural change that needs to take place in schools in India. Um, the second is, is, has built a, a network of 200 LGBTQI plus youth activists um, and our funding will help them to provide some training and, and networking opportunities uh, to that group. 
Um, our partner in Bangladesh is working with young Rohingya refugees in the Cox's Bazar refugee camp. Uh, Intimuda Jawabarat in Indonesia uh, has had funding previously from the Global Fund to do street-based peer outreach and have found that their younger um, peer outreach workers experience harassment and violence on the street. So they're using some funding to document that and take that as an advocacy tool back to Global Fund and change the model um, so that they're less, less vulnerable. Uh, and Kaiser in the Philippines is training and resourcing 12 youth leaders from four provinces uh, across the country to implement projects in their own lo localities and their own communities. Uh, we're also supporting three domestic projects. Uh, one is with LGBTQI plus young people in out-of-home care. Um, I'm from Victoria, a state that's been re really progressive in general on LGBTQI plus issues, but has completely missed out the group of kids that they have the most responsibility for, which is kids in state care. So that project is largely a an advocacy project. Um, and now finally, you, you, you probably long ago hoped I would shut up. I'm going to hand over to Manu and Shan uh, to talk a bit about their projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'd like to also start by acknowledging the land which I'm on today uh, and also acknowledge lived experiences yeah, in, in the room today as well and also acknowledge the work that those who are before me are doing. Um, I am Manu, I used to pronounce uh, they, them, and I'm happy to share the space with you today. Um, I'll talk more about um, yeah, my experiences working in, in the community as an advocate and um, community development worker around with LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. Um, apart from one of the big programs I work with um, LGBT refugees and asylum seekers in Melbourne is working with LGBT kids from newly arrived families or um, refugees and asylum seeker families down in the southeast where my community is in, in Daninong area in, in Victoria. Um, as, um, as we were approaching end of last year, um, one of the biggest programs that uh, we came, uh, we're working in, in Via the Rainbow was working in a school in the Southeast. Um, <clears throat> and it's about, um, uh, we had a school, school program um, working with kids, LGBT kids from newly arrived families, mostly um, who come from um, refugee and asylum seeker background. And that came about, the work came about when um, school kids or families that we came across in our work with LGBT refugees and asylum seeker talked about their, their kids who are newly arrived going to school and learning all those, um, yeah, the new things around LGBTQIA+, the rainbow, yeah, queer and everything, where the parents wanted to sort of understand yeah, where the kids are, the communities that they all live are quite conservative, I would say, wanted to learn uh, what the kids are learning from, from the co-ed schools that they are attending. And the kids themselves wanted to know uh, what are the best uh, tools that they could work on and how can they safely talk about it with their parents and peers in school. So we started a 10-week um, program down in the school in, in Southeast where we had the first program at nine yeah, kids who are from uh, newly arrived families, refugee and asylum seeker background and they're LGBT coming in for 10 weeks, giving them tools on, on working on respective relationship, talking it positively around with the, the community and families often, quite often, around how uh, the basis of still um, observing their faiths as most of them had come from faith backgrounds and talking it um, safely with their parents in the communities. And the first thing, yeah, we talked about with kids is um, yeah, identifying safe places that they they see at home or around their communities. And one of the kids I remember in my program, yeah, got up and said, yeah, the only safe places I see is in this peer group now and only when I close the door at my house. And so we had to ask them, so how do, what do you want? How, what do you think we could make safer for you to feel safe in other spaces as well? So the children, yeah, co-designed and co-led how the programs that they want, the community, their parents, and their schools to perceive and see them. So one of the things is to invite their peers and allies in their classes to come and learn from yeah, newly arrived kids who are LGBT in the program as well. And that was wonderful where they brought food in and they all share which culturally food is something that we all talk together. 
And for LGBT kids from asylum seeker and um, refugee backgrounds who are newly arrived, find it very open and a safe space for them to talk with food to their allies, uh, children in schools, as well as the teachers and this, uh, the well-being teachers, uh, the well-being officers in the schools openly around their sexuality and gender. And towards the end of the program, one of the young persons came out to their, to their family, which I was so happy with. Um, their parents and um, they, uh, especially they said that dad who was resistant wanted to learn more and wanted to connect. So we, after the program, we had great feedback from those children because it's about working for us. It's working with the community, uh, religious leaders from and the teachers as well in, in the school for the, and, uh, for the LGBT uh, refugee and asylum seeker background kids to feel safe, talk about it openly in, in the communities as well. So we are looking forward to the next stage um, in a few uh, months that we are in talks with the parents, to have the parents group who are refugees and asylum seeker um, parents who would come in and learn how, what the kids are going through, those kids in, in the group focus group that we are running, and understand yeah, yeah, more in, in terms of understanding the kids as well. And, and, and that is yeah, one of the great things that we do within the, we are the rain, rainbow uh, frameworks of the working around community and in the social, social economic ways of um, working with the children and what they wanted and what, how they wanted this, the spaces to be safe for them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so my name is Sean. I am a Gordonu Barkindji in Lungu from far west New South Wales, a little Aboriginal community called Wilcannia. Um, and I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I lend my respect um, to honour their elders, past and present, and future elders and future ancestors. And I'd like to also honour um, Mob who are with us in the room today. So some of the work... Um, that I've been doing mainly volunteer work. So it's, I have a day gig um, as senior leader, community engagement with the New South Wales Department of Education. Um, presently, I am based on the New South Wales Victorian border um, in a regional community called Sunraysia, um, but in Mildura. And uh, so some of, I've got my dot points, because uh, Ian, spoke at length, so I want to uh, make sure I touch on everything, but also keep us um, within time. Um, so some of the work I've been doing um, is with a youth group um, named Team Family, and the kids came up with this name. Uh, so they're a bunch of uh, queer kids who are in the Sunraysia, Mildura area, um, and I've also been interim president of our Mali Pride group um, for a little while now. And some of the young people were like, Anishan, there's always stuff going on for grown folks. What about us? So it sort of branched off from there that uh, Mali Pride was having a lot of social gatherings, um, organising a lot of fun things, and just um, providing a place for community and a lot of our youth sort of felt left out a little. Um, so yeah, we, we have been focusing, you know, on how to address those complex issues surrounding, you know, intersectionality of our youth who, you know, are young people that comes with challenges, um, but they're also queer and that comes with another set of challenges. Um, so Ian touched on it a little bit, um, where Australia has a lot of safeguards in place to protect children. Um, you know, you apply for a job in the public sector, you join a working with children's check. Um, there are a lot of legislation, there are a lot of advocacy groups that protect the rights of children and young people, as it should be. What we 
found is our queer youth and children um, sometimes, a lot of the time, most of the time, are left out of um, a lot of the strategy and the planning and the community work. Um, for whatever reason, a lot of the organisations and services maybe put their needs in the too hard basket. Maybe they don't have the um, workforce to work with our youth and children. Or maybe they just, you know, haven't been given the funding and don't want to invest that time and energy. Um, so the kids that I work with, I lovingly call them kids. Um, so from 12 years old to around 26. Um, and the way that I approach the work is from a decolonised um, Aboriginal lens. I'm, I'm auntie to them. Being an auntie um, in our communities means that you're the person who the young people go to when there's nobody else. Um, we're usually the ones who will have your back no matter what. Um, sometimes having, you know, butting heads with parents of the children because we're ultimately the ones who have their back and will always <laughs> provide a space for them, um, make time for them and love them unconditionally. So that's a cultural thing. Um, and a lot of the youth and children that I work with are Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, um, also coming from refugee asylum seeker, ex-detainee backgrounds. Um, that's the makeup of the majority of our community because um, it's a fruit-growing region. Pretty transient people um, from all over meet there um, and have done for a long time. So that's the sort of the background of the community I'm working in. Um, so all of these children and young people come with their own traumas, um, intergenerational trauma. But one of the things that they were crying out for was spaces to feel safe, to be themselves, and to ultimately have fun. They deserve to be children. Children deserve joy and to live in the moment and to have fun. And this was coming from them when we would sit around and have our yarning sessions. They're like, aunt, we just want to be somewhere where it's okay to be us and we can just have some fun. So the work that I do with Team Family, um, they chose the name, uh, is helping our queer children and young people to build capacity um, for a number of things, and I've just got some things listed here. So reducing social isolation, coming out of uh, lockdown. Victoria was uh, first to go into really strict lockdown. The kids were just um, feeling as isolated as we all were. Uh, so experiencing respectful relationships. That one was important um, namely because the children and young people at home may not have relationships that are respectful towards them and that shows them that this is how, when people respect you, this is how they treat you. And that's very important. Um, they don't want to go on in life and accept being treated poorly. Um, so with the work, the peer-to-peer -peer work, they are modelling that respectful behaviour, which has been really great to see. Um, so building connections and maintaining those connections. Uh, our region, while the population is very diverse, um, still a lot of racism, a lot of discrimination, um, a lot of homophobia, transphobia, um, all of the phobias, so there's a lot of that going on. The region sometimes isn't very safe for people like myself, let alone our most vulnerable, which are our children and young people. Um, so with these connections, we're hoping that it, it builds community um, and our young people have somewhere safe to feel like they belong. Uh, so we do a lot of co-design stuff as well for designing um, projects and some other activities, so influencing fun activities for young people. 
so bringing them together um, and elevating their voice and hearing what they have to say. So there are two aspects uh, with team families, ways in how we work, and that's the relationship building with peers, with families, with community, and the co-design and voice stuff. So that comes from a collective impact model um, whereby, you know, the most impacted individuals are the ones that have the loudest voice in how we find the solutions for the issues. So we view them as being the experts in their own lives, uh, just here to be an auntie and support and guide, but it's ultimately their voice, what is important to them and the ways that they want to move forward. So on the one hand, we're a social group that does, you know, like fun stuff like pool picnics or pizza day or movie nights or roller derby, um, some of the ideas that they come up with and want to do, um, hangouts, you know, feeling safe and things like that. But on the other hand, we have a backbone team uh, that's made up of eight queer youth and children. Uh, that group, I think, yeah, ages are from 12 to 23. And... They are a focused collective impact backbone team, which means with the support um, from We Are The Rainbow, we've been able to organise workshops for the backbone group to come in, um, workshop their issues, speak about what's important to them, uh, test some of their ideas, go back to their peers out in community and say, hey, does this sort of represent, you know, some of the issues going on for us, if their peers are saying, yeah, take it back to, you know, the work that you're doing, so they bring it back. And through assistance from um, the organisation, the lovely humans here uh, work tirelessly on, we've been able to pay our backbone team and, and pay our youth and children um, for their knowledge, for their expertise and their them coming together and they're actually doing the work on the ground. Um, because for the most part, the pool picnics, the pizza days, the movie nights come out of my pocket. It's volunteer work and I do it because I love community. Um, I love working with youth and, you know, they, they deserve to have nice things. And in, in all of that, I've learned so much from them as well. Um, while some of the language around being queer has changed, I guess, in the last 10 years, um, some of the ideas around people self-presenting and the young people are just, they're all over it. Like, they know things that we... Did, it didn't even cross our minds, you know, back in, back in the day. And so for me coming at it from an auntie's view where I, I get to hang out with these amazing young people. I, my phone's always turned on for them. Um, I get to speak to their families as well. So there's ways that I can help, um, you know, their families have questions. Um, so I'm able to do that part of the work and I'm able to, you know, approach organisations, the council, services, things like that. And make sure that they have every opportunity, um, every bit of information that they deserve to know that's readily available to them. But they're the ones out there doing the work. And it's so great to see because one of the things I was speaking to um, another colleague about was, you know, the, this generation or maybe the next generation are going to be the ones who don't have to heal from that trauma that we're healing from. And to me, that's one of the biggest things that makes this work so important. Thank you. I think we've allowed ourselves a tiny, tiny time for, for questions, if there, if there are any. Is anyone yet getting any, aside from 
aside from your salary, but any funding from the Department of Education, New South mm -hmm. Wales? Okay. No. We're not getting government funding for any of this, um, and in fact we're getting very little funding. We've had a couple of donors who've supported their, the, the, the grant rounds. Um, all, of the, all of the actual work has been voluntary work. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do to take care of yourself? Do you while you're working with Checking with each other. That's, okay. that's a really great question. <laughs> Uh, it, no, it is. It is like that. It is right. like that. Yeah, and yeah. I think there's peer support that happens. Yes, we all happens support here. each other. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. If you need to. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you have any connection with deaf queer. Have you met with those group of people? And I'm also wondering if, say, your organisations if perhaps the deaf community could get access to information to your organisation, because they need it accessible in Auslan. So I was wondering if you would include that as well, or is that not something you've experienced? It, it's, it's something that um, was was raised in the, in the Philippines, uh, and we were able to work with uh, interpreters in the Philippines for a couple of the the, the, the larger meetings. Um, there weren't any deaf young people that attended any of the programs directly. Um, I would love to find a way that, that we can do that. Uh, the, the challenge, I guess, comes from, from our answer to the previous question, which is about not yet having funding to enable a lot of this work uh, to, be, to be put together, um, but we would be very keen to, to look at how we can make that happen. And I was just wondering if you could perhaps collaborate with other organisations to support you. So for example, I'm a part of the Deaf Aboriginal Service. I'm more than happy to collaborate and look for funds to look at how we can work together. Because I work with a lot of Deaf, Queer, Aboriginal First Nations people. And I think we could partner and not just leave it to you doing it yourself. I think collaboration is the best way to progress. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a teacher from the Australian Education Union, um, and it's always shocking to me how little funding these types of programs get from the Department of Education in their respective states. Um, as a teacher, uh, like you're doing such fantastic work, and teachers are, are so well placed to assist you and to do some of this work as well. Um, and as an activator, like this is maybe more of a comment, but in the teaching standards in Australia, there's no uh, standards for creating safe places for LGBTIQ young people, but there's a lot of accommodations, as there should be for students who are First Nations, have diverse learning needs, neurodivergent, but there's no accommodations in that. And so um, I guess a comment and, and a question, do you think that that would make your work easier if teachers were mandated to be able to show that they could provide that space in every classroom? It would, um, it would definitely make things easier. I guess, um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to answer that one in a way because every school is individual. And I know just from the school that I work at, um, while all of the teachers receive professional learning um, and they, a lot of the time, as you would know, teachers just don't have the extra time. Um, so that's one of the challenges I see. So it would be, they'd be like, is, it, is this an option? Is this mandatory? Um, yeah, things like that. So while it would, it would um, take a lot of the load off of the work that we do, I see, yeah, sort of coming up against where do we fit that in the programming of the semesters, yeah. Can I, I might just add to the, uh, that one as well. In, in, a, in a past life, in 2000, 2001, I was part of establishing a program called Safe In Schools, which was a precursor to Safe Schools in Victoria, which then went national and was, was killed off by the previous federal government. Um, I'm still horrified and disgusted that we as a community couldn't, couldn't pony up to fight that. Um, I know that we were drowning in marriage equality hideousness at the time, but we are big enough and strong enough to have two fights at once, and we gave that one up. Um, and now we have to do very, very hard work to get it back. Mm. Yep. Um, thanks so much.
so much, everyone. Uh, I've got a question for Ian. Um, so my name's Rani. I'm one of uh, I'm in an advisory committee with Plan International Australia. So I was just wondering, have you partnered with international children's rights organisations? I know you, your presentation was about UNICEF, but how about Plan and other? Great question. Thank you. Um, so the Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So, so the question was about um, international child rights and development agencies and whether we'd had the opportunity for partnership and collaboration there. Uh, Save the Children Philippines were very interested uh, to, to learn about our work and, and did some work with us. And they have actually partnered with that Davao City Coalition that we initially built a relationship with um, and Save the Children Australia and Oxfam Australia. We've had some active conversation. We've had a shared, a shared agreement that we'd love to work together um, and hasn't yet um, gelled into action. But yeah, we're keen to make it happen. Yep. Down the back. Um, so I'm a teacher in a special needs school that specialises in students with um, um, just extreme um, wellbeing needs. Um, what I've seen is that comfortably 50% of our student population are LGBTQ. Um, of that, another half of those students are gender diverse in some way, and they often find their ways to our school because, um, quite frankly, mainstream school has been a place of trauma for them, and so the way that they're finding their way to us having missed 12 to 18 months of schooling just flat out haven't been um, in, in, in line with the other COVID complications. Um, I guess the question is about what can we do from to sort of shift that dial so that, um, for instance, how can we get safe schools back up and happening because it's so desperately needed? Thank you. And the, so the question was about you know, how, how, we can, how we can build this back up and how we can do more work in, in schools, the work that needs to happen in schools. Um, I, I, I'm disappointed. I, I, I know that there's been a fantastic and, and incredible agenda across the three days here, but I'm kind of disappointed that we're in the graveyard shift um, with the only session that's dedicated specifically to talking about children and young people. Um, I think we need to take that, that back um, to recognise that it's our broader community that has to, has to um, yeah, advocate for that work. I think we, we have a new federal government uh, with, a, you know, with a clearly a different agenda and a, and, and a different way of working with, with communities like ours. So there is, there is the chance now to do that. Um, but I think if I can pick up your point about um, the school that you work in, and, and, and I've seen that very strongly in schools that we've, we've partnered with in, in Melbourne as well, and it absolutely does highlight that LGBTQI plus young people are still being pushed out of mainstream schools. Uh, it's 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 yeah. That there's a lot a lot of work done. That if you're if you're comfortable and fabulous and um, able to articulate your needs comfortably, that that those those needs will be met in you know affluent schools and and inner city schools. It doesn't necessarily translate everywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, as a Filipino man in the third week, I would love to thank all of you for the work that you've done. You. Watching those videos is still a hard thing to enjoy. Um, my question is, back when you were doing this in the Philippines, you had to um, deal with uh, traditional culture and religious institutions. Um, and how did you deal with them? It's a, it's a big question. I, I think largely we passed under the radar of, of religious institutions and, I, and I'm aware that that probably is the, the, next, the next big challenge. Um, and when I say we, I didn't have to deal with it, but clearly you know, the young people and the communities we're working with were and are dealing with that on a very regular basis. Um, uh, my, my sense is that um, that work with parents and with, the, you know, with, with other allies is, is where we might be able to start to, um, to be able to kind of take on that, on that discussion that needs to happen. Uh, but you know, the, the other thing that I saw, um, and, and please um, share, share your experiences if, if, if what I'm saying is not, is not correct, but I saw a real difference between LGBTQI plus Manila and LGBTQI plus Davao. Um, and the communities we were working in, in Davao were kind of multiply disadvantaged. Um, and in some ways that gave a freedom to do things that may have been harder in other places because it was less noticeable. But it also meant there, was, there were so many challenges that the community was facing that, that that was one that they weren't yet prepared to have or able to have. Yeah. Um, interesting. So you made some comments 
build your own around the interaction between um, you and sort of social services. Um, this trailer obviously has a history of um, taking children away from their parents without a lot of reason, but at the same time, um, queer kids often don't get the choice to um, return to where they live mm. and not being stuck in horrible circumstances. So how, how do you, you or how does social services, I guess, amplify the voice of the child and um, help them to kind of make their own decisions and not just get stuck with what the parents mm. think is best, what they think is best? I think yeah, when, it, when it comes to children and young people who are not able to live with their families due to you know, whatever the you know, whatever issues, including perhaps homophobic or transphobic prejudice. Um, the every state now has a kind of a best interests principle in in terms of their child protection work. But absolutely, that that uh, yeah, the the parents' rights still seem to trump the the rights of the children in so many of the, the, of, the, of those kind of discussions and where placements actually happen. Um, in Victoria, and I'm not sure if it's the same in other states, foster care agencies have been promoting themselves to queer community looking for carers for years now um, without actually picking up the hard work around LG LGBTQI plus kids. Um, so I know that's not an answer. I guess I'm just highlighting that there's a, a lot of work to be done there. Um, and uh, I, I was a, a, a foster carer as half of an openly gay couple in 1995 and what that got me was on the front page of the Herald Sun and um, the Deputy Prime Minister poking me in Parliament saying this shouldn't happen in this country um, and a whole lot of hideous stuff as well. So we, I know that we have travelled a long way since then but there's a huge amount of work that still needs to happen. Uh, two more questions on at the back and you. Uh, you. Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you. This is the last question because we're eating into your lunches if you don't already know that. Um, um, so um, I wanted to ask as well, when running these youth spaces, do you feel like there's also the intersect of neurodiverse and, and, um, and with mental health challenges as well in these kids as well? And what kind of things do you put in place to help support these kids? Um, coming as someone, as a young person who also runs a youth space with their kids, um, I find it um, really important to try and identify these challenges and what supports um, are necessary to be able to help uh, give, give a good positive space. We could all have a go at that one. Yeah, um, I mean, through my program down in, in Dandenong area, we, we had a few young people who identified in the neurodiverse spectrum where we, first of all, is setting group rules and asking the young person how what do we do to make that space inclusive and safe for you? And that answer comes from that person. So, you know, that we had to integrate into uh, the, our planning as well as creating safe spaces for that young person as well in, in terms of understanding of the whole group um, uh, dynamics. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's about creating those spaces and it has to come from that young person itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I don't know if... Yeah, absolutely. Um, listening to what young people want, um, helping them build the capacity to talk to their peers and, you know, bring back strategies, bring back 
the things that are important, um, the supports that they might need, or just helping them have the space to talk about issues. And then, even if they don't know what they might need, by sitting with each other and talking about it, uh, you know, most of the time they will come up with their solutions on what is safe for them, um, what feels good for them, uh, and whatever supports that they may need. And when you just get them sitting around, and it's not like me with a pen saying, OK, young people, tell me what you need. That's not organic. That do It doesn't work that way. But when it's them all together, um, you know, in a, a place that they're comfortable, yeah. a lot of those conversations just happen naturally. And because, like I said, they're the experts in their lives, we're just here to support. Um, they already have those answers. They just need the rest of us to get with the program and provide, you know, the support and the steps and hold their hand and walk in with them um, so that they can ultimately help themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. And this last one comment before Shahan uh, closes up off. It's from um, online. Someone said, education and inclusion is also a problem here in far south of what, At Atora. Uh, Rainbow, people, uh, Rainbow people exist outside the large cities. And the person is asking, how can we get more in this region? And thank you. That is a great comment because we've seen, I'm from Victoria, where um, you see services for young people and youths in, in the um, inter places of, of Melbourne. But there are young people living in Deninong and Werribee. Why can't we extend services out to them? There are young people living in Mildura. The, all the fundings are centred in, in bigger cities where that's not the only places that young people live. We had to now learn to work outside of, of the cities or the regions that we work with in, in creating other such spaces for young people as well. Yeah, it was 25 years between setting up a first safe youth space in Melbourne and setting up something in Mildura. Um, so, yeah, 25 years is 25 years too long. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Great. I, I, I'm sorry, just before we take that, I might recognise that we are eating into people's lunches. So if people would like to... If, 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 you're, if you're hungry, please feel... Yeah, it, it's okay to get up and leave, but we're happy to hang back and continue yeah. to answer questions. Yeah. Are you going to read this one? Thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 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 You can read that then. We go. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Sorry, everyone. Just um, want to let everyone know that there will be a very culturally significant moment um, at the end of today. So First Nations. Representatives of Sydney World Pride will be handing over a message stick to representatives of Capital Pride um, as a symbol of how our conversations will continue in Washington, D.C. and all over the world, uh, Prides to come. So please make sure you stick around to see this incredible moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.